but this is an amazing week. Uh, Genesis chapter 3. It's one of, I think I say this every week, it's one of my favorite parts of the Bible. Uh, not the sin part, um, although that explains everything. If you look around the world today, everything is explained by Genesis chapter 3. Now let me pray for us and then we'll get, we'll get studying. God, thank you for your kindness, your graciousness, your mercy. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you that we can rest and trust in you. Thank you that you make all things new. May we love you more when we leave than we did when we walked in because we know you more. Amen. Week number four in our series in Genesis. We've been through creation. Last week we looked at the image of God and what that means. He, he made the male and female and what that means. And, and Adam and Eve were both made in the image of God. Everything was good. Actually, everything was very good. At the end of creation, God said, and it was very good. Imagine, if you will, you have a perfect relationship with your spouse. Absolutely perfect. Nothing, no tension, no anxiousness, no, it's perfect. Imagine also you have a perfect relationship with your creator. There's no, no questioning, no doubt, no wondering. There's, there's just an intimate relationship with him. No pain, no angst, everything is beautiful. In fact, your, your relationship with your creator is closer than any human being has ever been. You physically walk with God. You talk with God. He has a close relationship with you. But there's, there's one thing that's forbidden. There's a tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, and God put it, and when he planted this amazing garden for you, it's in the midst of the garden. It's the one prohibition that you have. Don't eat of this tree. It's surrounded by amazing fruit trees, amazing, I guess you could have amazing vegetables. But everything is amazing. Nothing wrong. But you can't eat of this tree. And one day, you're, you're by that tree. You're there. Right next to the tree, the, the forbidden thing, you're you're there, you're right by it, and suddenly something or, or someone starts talking to you, starts having a conversation, and it, he brings doubts about God. Is God really good? Is, is God really good? If he was, why would he prevent you from eating of this tree? There must be something really good about this tree, otherwise he wouldn't keep you from it. And because he's keeping you from it, he must not be good. Does God really know what's best? Does he really want what's best for you? Right, well, many of us, well, none of us have experienced absolute perfection. We know the tempter's voice all too well. Is God really good? We've heard his allegations about our loving creator. We know what goes through our minds when we hear him. Did God really say we shouldn't take what's not ours? Did God really say we shouldn't do certain things? Did God really say that we shouldn't have any sexual relationship outside of marriage? If God was good, why would he prevent us from doing those very things that we want to do? Is God really good? Throughout humanity, from the time of Adam and Eve to now, nothing has changed, has it? It's still the same voice. It's still the same allegations. It's still the same lies. And so Eve is, is by the tree and she looks. She's standing with her husband. Her, her husband is standing right next to her. And the tempter talks to the woman. 
Adam is abdicating his role as a husband, as the leader. And the woman listens to the tempter. The fruit is pleasing to the eyes. It looks so good. Man, sin does that, doesn't it? It looks so good. If it didn't look good, we wouldn't want it. It's the, it's the wet paint sign. It's the, I was driving yesterday in, in one of the parking decks in Calga Falls, and, and the lower level has, it's all blocked off. Nothing makes me want to look in a room more than when it's blocked off. I want to see what's going on. Don't go in there. I want to, I got to know what's happening. Right? We have the same desires. It's the same pull. Something that you're not supposed to do. I want to do that. Our hearts are immediately drawn. So Eve, the woman, listens to the tempter. She takes hold of the fruit. She, she wants to gain wisdom. I mean, it's, it's a noble thought, isn't it? She wants to gain wisdom. We want to be wise, don't we? And so she... She doesn't listen to the voice of her creator. She takes and eats, and she gives some to Adam, and he takes and he eats. And immediately, immediately their eyes are opened. They see things differently. They gained wisdom, but was it good? They suddenly have feelings of guilt, new emotions. Negativity is there. Bad feelings are there. Angst, pain, suffering, guilt, sorrow, shame are all there. None of these feelings had ever been felt before. And there they are. All new emotions, they fall on them, and Adam and his wife try to hide from their sin. They make clothes of fig leaves to hide their nakedness. This isn't just physical nakedness. This is but to the core of who they are, is now seen. They are, they are wicked, they are evil, and they know it. Not only do they see themselves differently, they see each other differently. There's now tension in their marriage. New emotions, new feelings. Blame is now in their vocabulary. It's a, it's a word that hasn't left the mouths of spouses since. Blame is there. There's now a tension that was never there before. So much for desiring wisdom. Sometimes what we think is good when we don't listen to our creator, it isn't good. We've all been here though, haven't we? Have you ever done something that you're not supposed to do and immediately feel guilt, shame, remorse? You know that you have to face consequences. You know that You're going to have to answer for what you've done. Have you ever been called down to the principal's office? I know many of you haven't, but it's not a fun experience, I assure you. you. Have you been caught by your parents in a lie? Have you been called down to your, your boss's office? Or... Um, has, has your spouse or, or somebody else said, hey, we need to talk about what you did or what you said. I know these feelings all too well. And they're not fun. They're not exciting and they're not worth it. Imagine Adam. Adam was given explicit instructions by God. Do not eat of this tree or you will die. Pretty straightforward. Adam, you have all of this. Everything in creation is yours. Don't touch that. One thing that he couldn't do, and he did it anyway. His his initial reaction should make sense to all of us. He hid. He hid. God calls out to Adam and to the woman, where are you? He already knew. God doesn't not know where they are. He knows everything. He knows where they are. He created, though, an opportunity for them to come to him. He didn't immediately run to them and say, I saw what you did. Adam, and Adam, where are you? Where are you? 
He was allowing them for come to, to come to him so that their relationship with him could be restored. It's the beginning of the repentance process. When we hide because of sin, there is no opportunity for relationships to be healed or for sin to be forgiven. God didn't charge at them, run up to them and say, I saw what you did. He said, no, come to me. Come to me. Adam, where are you? Adam answered, God, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden, and I was afraid. I mean, imagine this. A, so a sound that used to be beautiful. A sound that, that they used to cherish. In the cool of the day, when they would hear the voice of their creator walking in the garden, and it was an opportunity for them to come to him and be with him and share time with him. Now was a sound that caused dread and fear and shame and sorrow. The sound of God walking in the garden caused them pain. That's what sin does. I heard you walking in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. At first, Adam didn't admit his sin, only that he was suffering the consequences of his sin. Adam, who, who told you that you were naked? God is so patient and so kind with his people. He could have immediately stricken Adam dead, destroyed all of creation and started over, but he didn't. Isn't the creator also our loving and gracious father? Adam, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Again, God knew the answer. He, understood, he knew what happened. But he's giving, an, he's giving Adam an opportunity to, to confess. Confess your sins. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God is talking with Adam here. He's giving him an opportunity to confess. But notice that, that Adam was supposed to be leading his wife. He was supposed to, he was the representative. He, he was the one that God told, do not eat of the tree. And Adam passed that on to his wife. God had the relationship with Adam. The, the, Adam was the leader. And he's answerable to his failure for, for that. He failed to lead and he's answerable to God. For I hear that, husbands. You are answerable to God when you fail to lead your family. And another further failure of leadership, Adam passes the blame. This is, like there are a few passages in Scripture that are ridiculous. This is one of them. Adam, who, who told you? Well, see, the woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. What's he doing? Ad, Adam blamed God to his face. God, see this, this woman that you created to be with me? She took the fruit, and she gave it to me, and I ate it. God, you did this. If you didn't do that, if you didn't make this woman, I wouldn't have eaten of the fruit. It's your fault, God. Sound familiar? We do this too all the time. God, you made me this way. I was born this way. God, it's, it's your fault. It's my genetic makeup. I didn't have any choice in this. I didn't have any choice in the things that I'm drawn to. God, you, you made me this way. It's your fault. This is all saying, God, it's your fault I sin like this. And we've learned from Adam to pass the blame, haven't we? It's gone down through every generation. Oh, the patience and graciousness and mercy of God. If that wasn't enough, Adam also blamed Eve. The two who were, had the most intimate relationship with Adam are the ones who got the brunt of his blame. Again, this is true in all marriages, is it not? 
we, we blame those we are less patient with those who are closest to us. God, it's, it's your fault and also hers. Because she took the fruit, she ate it, she gave it to me, and then I ate. Eve also shared the blame with somebody else. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now Adam, the woman, and the serpent were before the Lord. They're about to hear the consequences of their actions. They know that they're going to die. I mean, think about the draw of sin. The draw of sin is so strong that God told Adam, if you eat it, you will die. And what did Adam do? He ate it. The logic. The, the, there's nothing about this that he should want to eat the fruit. Because he knows the consequences. Temptation isn't always about logic. Actually, it's rarely about logic. Or being able to talk yourself out of doing something in the moment. Temptation can be really loud. It can be really persuasive. This is why you resolve ahead of time to avoid situations. Don't put yourself in danger. If Adam and Eve weren't by the tree, the serpent wouldn't have been able to give them the voice. If they weren't standing next to what they weren't supposed to eat, it would have been much harder for the serpent to tempt them. When we are in the areas where we are, where we're tempted, the likelihood is that we'll give in. Avoid the situations. Avoid the areas where you're tempted. So they're all waiting before the Lord to hear their consequences. But before God talks with Adam and Eve, he addresses the serpent. His grace and mercy in this are astounding. As he addresses the serpent, he gives our first parents hope. Amazing hope. So God addresses the serpent in 3, 14, and 15. There's a lot of debate on 3, 14, which we're not going to answer all of those questions right now. Cursed are you above all livestock. Above all the beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your lives. Did snakes have legs before? I don't know. Did, is, did the fall cause them to slither around? I don't know. Did they talk ahead of time? I, I don't know. Did, is this why we hate snakes? I don't know. I, I hate snakes. I'm reminded of a time we went to the zoo, and, and we went into a room, and it was the snake room, and Jenna screamed and screamed and screamed, where I thought like somebody was going to come and, and take her away from us. Like we were, snakes have this effect. Is this because of the fall? I don't know. Maybe they're just disgusting creatures. You see, the problem is we get, we get bogged down in trying to figure some of this stuff out, and we lose sight of what's being communicated. And there's a much greater promise in this curse. I'm convinced that many of the theories that we, and we'll see some later in Genesis, on, on we're not told exactly what something is, and people like to build these elaborate theories on, on what this is. We actually lose sight of what's being communicated. We don't know, and we speculate, and we lose sight of, of the important things. And that important thing in this section is Genesis 3.15. It is called the, the proto-evangelium. There's a fancy word for you that really means the first gospel promise. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and he and you shall bruise his heel. The word offspring here is seed. And it's a word that will come up over and over and over again, especially in Genesis. It is a very important word. One that, that will trigger memories, will trigger promises. Remember the word 
seed. The seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac and of Jacob and so on. Remember the phrase, the seed of the woman. As we go through Genesis, we'll refer to this promise over and over again. Because it's the thesis statement for the entire Bible, especially the Old Testament. Everything that you read in Scripture should be filtered through the lens of Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. As we go through Genesis, we'll see how this played an important role in the way that people acted, why they said, why they saw the things the way that they did. And what that led them to believe about the Messiah. The Messiah who we know is Jesus, who they didn't know who he would be. This is important because even if the initial readers didn't fully understand what was happening or what was promised, they had an idea. They had promises. Remember that that there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation was always through Jesus. He didn't always have the name Jesus until he was born. But in the the Old Testament, the, the promises were leading up to the cross. The New Testament, they're looking back at the cross. This is how we understand what they saw. There's a lot in this promise. First, remember that the serpent is Satan. Right? This is the promise that he will be defeated. The very first thing. And we know, again, that the fulfillment of this is in Jesus. But the Old Testament saints did not know who he would be. The curse to him is a promise to Adam and the woman. That he would make it all right. That God would make everything better. Before he told our first parents, the consequences of their sin, he told them, I will make it all right. Know this. He'll fix it. I'm going to fix what you have done. And I'm going to do it through one of your descendants, Eve. The seed of the woman. God will put enmity between the serpent and the seed of the woman. The word offspring, the word seed, is, is a word that's individual and collective. It means person or a group of people. We see the collective in Revelation 12, 17, when the dragon Satan went to wage war against the woman's seed. This is collective, the people of Israel in this passage, but it's a collective. Those who are offspring of the devil, the the seed of the serpent. Remember what Jesus said in John 8. Those who don't believe in him are children of the devil. Collective. But it's also singular, and we see this throughout Genesis. The promised one will crush the serpent's head. The serpent will bruise the promised one's heel. See this. Like we know that the cross happened. The cross is where the serpent's head was crushed. It's an amazing yet horrific event. We just celebrated Easter and Good Friday. And we see the pain of the judgment of the Father on the Son. And God calls that the bruise of a heel. Death has no power. Death has no power over him. It has no power over us. It is a bruise of the heel. Because God is so Amazing and strong. The damage that has been done by the serpent will be undone. Before we get to the consequences for humanity, God promises redemption. What an amazing and gracious God we serve. From the serpent, we get to to Eve, to the woman in verse 16. Notice that for the woman, the word curse is never mentioned, she doesn't have a curse. It's used with the serpent. It's used with Adam. Eve was deceived. Paul says this in 1 Timothy 2.14. Eve was deceived. Adam sinned intentionally. He receives the curse. She receives consequences. 
The sin for humanity flows through Adam. The serpent was deceptive. He lied about God. He's cursed. Adam sins intentionally. He's cursed. Eve was deceived. So while we get sin through Adam, the curse will be done, will be undone through the seed of the woman. There's a promise in this as well. The woman's consequences are in two areas. In her childbearing and in her marriage. She will have painful labor. The, even the whole idea of this, multiply your pain in childbearing, it is, it is labor focused, but it is also parenting focused. It's also the desire focused. It's all of those things. And yet, she will have painful labor. I remember when I was a kid, we had a dog. The dog had six puppies. It's amazing. She was like running around while this was happening. No care in the world what was going on. There, I can tell you there was no pain. I have sat through the birth of four children. It is a very different experience. And I will not tell you of the pain lest I get smacked after this. I can just tell you it was intense. There is a consequence there. The, the giving birth in the animal kingdom and in humanity is very different. But it's interesting that the curse will be undone through the painful childbearing that the woman will experience. The, the very consequence of the sin is what will be used to undo it. Second, the woman's desire will be for her husband. There has been much, much ink spilled on explaining what this means. The wife is, is to submit to her husband. This is, a cult, this is a biblical command found throughout Scripture. But he will rule over her. She subverted the created design by acting apart from Adam and eating of the fruit of the tree. She will desire to rule over her husband, but he will rule over her. Tension is in the marriage. Severe tension. Her desire will be contrary to Scripture and to God's design, and she will not succeed, but it's a constant struggle. And then you have the fallenness of man, and you have husbands who are unkind in this and doing it the wrong way. It is a constant, constant tension that we will face. Thus, in, in two areas where a woman should find the greatest joy, she will be reminded of the consequence of sin. And now we get to Adam, verses 17 through 19. We see here again that Adam directly disobeyed God by listening to Eve and eating of the fruit. And because of this, the ground is cursed. In the same way that Eve will have pain in childbirth, Adam will have pain in eating of the fruit of the ground. Husbands never make this comparison. Never come inside and say, you know, I was guarding today. I'm reminded of what your labor was like. Don't do that. Notice that both of these things, though childbearing and working the ground, are not the result of the fall. Both were in place before the fall. However, both become now more arduous and painful. Summer is approaching. Gardens are being planted. Flowers are being planted. And we're reminded of the fall every time we do this. It isn't easy work. It's fulfilling. It's fulfilling because we are created to do this. But weeds are everywhere. Everywhere. Like, everywhere. Why? Why? There's a little crack in the driveway and you got to grow there? Like, what is going on? It's a reminder of the fall. Thorns and thistles, weeds will be brought forth and we shall eat by the sweat of our brow. Again, work is not a result of the fall. Work being hard. Nature seeming to work against us. The pain, the weeds, drought, too much rain, not enough rain, Thorns, thorns grow up that stab you when you grab them or walk by them. All of this is a result of the fall. When you're gardening, when you're weeding, 
thank Adam for causing this. It's his fault. Not, not you, Adam. But this is, a reason, like, this is a reminder to us that we live in a fallen world. Next, we see Adam is going to die and all of humanity with him. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember, though, God's going to make it right again. And we see a glimpse of the hope that our first parents had. At this point, the woman had no name. We're in verse 20. The, the woman had no name. Woman, Adam's wife, your wife, this is what she's called. In verse 20, Adam names her Eve, the mother of all living. See the hope of the Genesis 3.15 promise in this name. He could have named her the deceived one. He could have named her the one who caused me to sin. He could have named her all kinds, the temptress, like all kinds of things. But he names her the mother of all living. The promise, Eve, the, the promise that God made is coming through you. The hope that's there. See also, this is what happens when we understand grace. This is what happens when we understand that we have been forgiven. Adam was shown grace by God, and he understood it. There's hope and grace in her name. Through the seed of the woman, God was going to make everything new. And Adam grabbed onto this promise. He grabbed onto it, and he used it to name her. After confessing their sin to the Lord, Adam and Eve understood grace. They understood hope. They understood God's promise. And now they're exiled out of the garden. They now know good and evil. They know it intimately. Their desire was fulfilled and the consequences were not good. Remember, though, that the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. They had to be removed lest they also take of the tree of life and live forever. Remember the passage in John 11 when Lazarus died. Martha comes running out to Jesus and he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And then Mary came running out to Lazarus, and it said that Jesus wept. Isn't it amazing that Jesus wept in this moment? See, we, we cry at funerals for two reasons. One, we're going to really miss the person. There's a sadness that's there. But something much greater, we're reminded of the fall. We're reminded of the consequence of our sin. Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. He wasn't crying because he was going to miss Lazarus. He was crying because he saw the depth of our sin and what it cost. We're reminded of our sin. All of us will die one day. Tomorrow is not guaranteed for anybody. I just did the funeral of a 51-year-old who died suddenly. And his daughters looked at me and said, I just saw him the day before and he was fine. This is life. We have rebelled against a holy God. We have perverted his creation and his design, and we will all physically die. But we're also dead spiritually. We are born dead spiritually. We are dead. But yet when you repent of your sin, you become a follower of Jesus. You are reborn. This is a spiritual birth. We were dead to sin, but we are alive in Christ. Brothers and sisters, if you are a follower of Jesus, the curse has been broken. The curse has been broken. You are alive in Christ and you will live forever. But the next time you drive by a cemetery, be reminded of sin. But be reminded that the cemetery is not your final destination. If you are found in Christ, you will be with him forever. And it starts now, in this life. If you are not in Christ, you will be separated from him forever. This is called the second death. But just as God called out to Adam and Eve for their repentance, he calls out to all of us for ours. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 